one of my patrons challenged me to think and talk about how I handle large max patches. I've always felt that there is a massive trade-off involved between avoiding huge monolithic patches and hiding complexity in too many levels of sub-patches. While the latter practice certainly helps you tidy up your programs, there is also an accompanying sense of losing clarity and control. So yes, it seems like there is a lot to talk about here, so I decided to start a series on refactoring Max. This first episode will deal with when and how to extract code into an abstraction. First, an unambiguous sign that you should extract is when you encounter duplication, but it turns out that this is often more difficult to recognize than it sounds. Basically, I find myself encapsulating code in two types of abstractions. One, those that deal with data or signal transformation and or processing. You could call this a uh, functional type. And two, those dealing with manipulation, managing and holding of state or data. You could call this uh, object oriented if you like. While you'll find more opportunities for the first one, given that the whole range of audio processes fall onto it, that's no surprise. We'll start thinking about the latter type. Whenever you find yourself repeating a noun that you can combine with various verbs, chances are you have found an object that can receive and optionally even respond to messages, a classic pattern in object-oriented software design. Potentially one that even adheres to the single responsibility principle, which can serve as a guideline to find object boundaries. To keep your abstractions reusable or composable, it's pivotal that they don't try to do too much pull in functionality that doesn't belong to their primary use case. Let's look at some examples. The first is a very simple one. Suppose we have some external application which sends us OSC messages to select and deselect something, say a track. It does so however on a button press, so every transition from 0 to 1 will mean a change of state, e.g. the track is enabled or not. This is very common with MIDI controls and the like. We will simulate this with a UTP send object and some message boxes. Now when the message arrives, we first have to identify the OSC message. We can do this very easily with route. I know that there are more sophisticated options, but that's not the point here. Now we need to listen for changes, so let's take a change object and connect the first outlet, the one that outputs the number we get fed in, if it changes, to a select one. We know that the number coming in will either be a 0 or a 1, right? So if it is 1, we switch a toggle. Now we do this for every check, so we copy-paste. Done, right? Then all of a sudden, we encounter a new requirement. We need to be able to report the state of the toggle to an external caller. How do we do that? One option is patter. Now we need to insert it into every track. And here is the point where you should get suspicious. One, we have duplication. And now we need to edit every single copy. Not good. Two, we have a message that we can send. What is your state? And receive an answer to. I'm on. So it does seem as we'd want to make an abstraction. What do we call it? Well, continuing with our example, let's call it a track toggler. We add a route object that will switch on incoming messages and call the message is on question mark. Let's try it out.
seems to work as expected. Now all of a sudden we get a new requirement. We should be able to set the initial value of the toggler to either 0 or 1. How can we approach that? Luckily Max's abstractions have a special notation for that. A pound sign followed by a 1, 2, etc. will give you the argument we passed to that abstraction. So if we say load mess, pound sign 1, this should send the first argument at creation time. We just need to defer this to the end of the low priority queue, so it won't fire until everything else is set up. Let's see. Works as advertised. Now we begin to see that with such an abstraction we can respond to feature requests quickly. What if we'd like to make the trigger threshold dynamic? What if we'd also like to store the history of changes? You get the point. Maybe another quick example just to illustrate the principle. Here we have a patch that loads in all files in the folder, presumably they are all WAV files, and auto-populates a U menu. We can then send a number to the menu to select and output the prefixed path, which we will use to open an SF play object here. There's not too much going on here, but there are a few things to discuss. First, we obviously hold a primitive state in form of the entries of the new menu. Two, we send messages to it, such as the opening of the folder or the playback of files. And three, there are obvious extension points, such as the SF place channel count. All of this seems very worthy of being encapsulated in an abstraction, but I would argue there is one point that needs to be considered very carefully. Would you like to include the opening of the folder dialog in the abstraction, send it a bang and then have it populate the menu? Everything would be in one place, right? But then what if we make multiple copies of this player and end up with a myriad of open dialogues we have to click through? Not so good. I would argue that including the folder choosing logic into the abstraction violates the single responsibility principle. After all, we're making a player, not a file system utility abstraction. So here's where I'd draw the boundary in front of the prepend prefix object. That way we can pass in folder paths from wherever they may come from, be it a user input, an OSC command or whatever. There's even no need to extend the object's interface because all messages are passed directly to the U-menu. That said, I'd always advise you to be as explicit as possible when designing your code like this. Imagine weeks or months going by before you encounter this abstraction again, you'd be very glad if the messages you can send it gave you a hint at what you can do with it. <laughs> 